Good afternoon. Today, I'm going to speak about the most important updates in COVID-19 and kidney. Before starting the presentation, I'd like to declare that I have no industrial purposes. Through this presentation, I'm going to uh, discuss eight points. Introduction. COVID-19 and different nephrology domains, AKI, CKD, dialysis, and transplantation. Raspolocade use in COVID patient. Few statements about anemia management in COVID patient. Vitamin D, antiviral drugs against COVID or to ameliorate uh, the disease few issues about the neurological perspectives, uh, and then I'm um, coming to the conclusion. To start with, it is a very challenging presentation for me. Why? Because through the activities of ECNT, CME, and distance learning chapter, we have 14 videos with approximately 22 hours already for discussion of different aspects of COVID. Today, I'm going to give the hot messages and some new updates. I'd like to start with this slide. If we are speaking about COVID or coronavirus, this means that we are speaking about the virus and the host and the human being and immunity. If the host is fine, everything is, is healthy, the immune system is well toned. What will happen? Nothing. The disease will be clarified or uh, there is mild manifestation. But if there is disruption, disturbance, and infantility, infantile system of immunity, what will happen? And instead of combating the virus, the immune system will become dysregulated and attacking the body systems leading to problems in the heart, kidney, and liver in the form of cytokine storm and its consequences. So if we have good immunity, everything will be fine and the, the person will clarify the virus. And in some situation, the virus uh, finds abnormal immune system with subsequent inflammation, cytokine storm, and multi-organ failure. This is a nice point because it is the obesity, discussing the obesity and the mortality among the patients diagnosed with COVID that was published and released uh, at the site of Annals of Internal Medicine uh, yesterday. It is a retrospective cohort study, including approximately 7,000 patients with COVID-19. And here, if this, the focus is obesity, if you look here, the relationship between COVID these are the final adjusted risks for death in overall population. The lower the body mass index below 18.5 kilograms per square meter, and the higher body mass index of 40 or above, the higher the mortality. This means that the very low body mass index is bad, and the very high body mass index is bad too. So the relationship between body mass index and Mortality in COVID patient is U-shaped curve or J-shaped curve. Especially if we have morbid obesity, we are in a real risk of mortality. Again, the, the older the age, the higher the mortality in COVID-19 patient. If we address all these comorbidities that uh, here you can find different comorbidities, among these comorbidities, organ transplantation is associated with significantly increased risk of death in COVID-19 patients. The first question, what is the link between kidney diseases and COVID-19? Simple answer, it is bi-directional relationship. What's meant by bi-directional relationship? Patient with uh, renal diseases, are more susceptible to the COVID-19. And the presence of kidney dysfunction or kidney diseases in COVID-19 patients is bad news and associated with 
severe disease and mortality. To the extent this, this is the correlation of inpatient death with renal profile. The higher the degree of proteinuria, as you see here in this, part, in, the part, in this part of the figure, the higher the degree of proteinuria, the higher cumulative incidence of mortality. The higher the, the degree of uh, hematuria, the higher the risk of mortality. Higher baseline PUN and serum creatinine. So baseline chronic kidney disease is associated with increased mortality. And occurrence of acute kidney injury is associated with progressive increase in mortality. The question is, does SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus responsible for COVID disease, does it affect directly the kidney? This is one of the studies. If you look here, this is the, the, the figure, figure, including this number of patients, and assessing a COVID affection of lung and other organs. If we see here, lung is, the, the virus is there, I, and by confocal microscopy, you can see the virus in glomerulus and the renal tubules. So this means that kidney may be affected directly by, by the virus. Acute kidney injury. This is one of our publications that is just accepted to, be, to appear in the issue of GSNT in, the, in October and with Dr. Muhammad Abdelberry, assistant lecturer of nephrology at Mansoura University. Here, this is one of the uh, key figures in this article. What is the possible physiology of uh, acute kidney injury in COVID patients? We have multiple factors. Either direct viral cytopathic effect, so SARS-CoV-2 binds to a CT receptor, which is highly expressed in the kidney tubules and the podocytes. SARS-CoV-2 was demonstrated in renal tubules in autopsy, as I'm going to show in a minute. A viral application of podocytes uh, and uh, could account for proteinuria reported in COVID-19 patients. So this is direct viral cytopathic effect. The second mechanism is hemodynamic instability and the cytokine storm, which can be encountered in COVID patients. AKI in acute respiratory disease syndrome, many hemodynamic changes, and acute tuba necrosis. The third pathophysiological mechanism is hypercoagulable state and the microthrombi in it, immunity and the coagulation pathways are linked together. Cytokine storm can result in activation of coagulation pathway. And you can see in easily way, it is DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy with dominant thrombosis. And this is the situation. What about the ultrastructure evidence for the direct renal affection, infection? This is one of the publications showing, as you see here, isometric vacuolization of renal tubules by Dean blue stained specimen and the electromicroscope by high modification. If you look here, high magnification, you can see the viral particles here and there. And this is by higher magnification, the virus and with decorated spikes. So this is uh, fine. Uh, so this is a proof for diet renal infection and affection. An autopsy of 26 patients the virus in these patients, this due to respiratory failure, average is, is 69 years, and nine out of 26 showed clinical signs of kidney injury. And this is the light microscopic appearance of acute tubular injury and the red cell aggregate. You can see here the, the evidence of tubular injury, dilatation of renal tubules, and the presence of red cell aggregates. And the electromicroscope virus in tubules and the podocyte, as you see here. And the, by this uh, immune fluorescence, you can see SARS-CoV nuclear protein detection. So this study uh, showed clearly a direct parenchymal infection of tubular epithelial cells and the podocytes with marked acute tubular injury and the erythrocyte aggregation that occur in severe lethal COVID-19 uh, diseased patients. Does COVID or SARS-CoV-2, the virus, causes a specific dysfunction of proximal convulsive tubule? This is a very nice study 
that it's just accepted in Kidney International. As you see here, it's 49 patients with COVID-19, and you see the uh, biomarkers of uh, proximal tubule affection, uh, uh, urinary beta-2 microglobulin, uh, protein uh, creatine ratio, albumin creatine ratio, hyperuricemia, and a lot of biomarker. So there is an association with severity and the outcome of COVID-19. So SARS-CoV-2 causes specific manifestation of proximal tubule dysfunction, including low molecular weight protein. And this table summarizes the number of tests done for the patients and number of positivity. If we look at urinary beta-2 microglobulin above this value, it is tested in 49 and the positive in 67% of the cases. Bro urinary protein, bro protein creatinine ratio above this value in 85%. Urine albumin creatinine ratio, it is 98%. Hypouricemia in 47%. With an appropriate urocosoria, 46%. Hypo Phosphatemia with an appropriate phosphatoria in this percentage, amino acidurium for 60%, low molecular weight protein, 67%, normal glycemia, glycemic glucosuria. It is uh, done for 43 patients and none uh, was uh, positive. So almost the majority of this test showed evidence of affection of proximal completed tubule functions and as you see here this is the uh, 60 patients tubular injury is documented in all brush more than five out of six vacuolis uh, luminal debris in four uh, vacuolization in one case red cell aggregate in five cases a glomerular alteration in one case so the, this is documentation of proximal convoluted tubule dysfunction and the structure changes. This is six patients with autopsy findings. So in hospitalized patients, what is the state of acute kidney injury nowadays? I like this article because it, it addresses five, almost 5.5 thousand uh, uh, patients admitted with COVID-19. AKI is diagnosed in 36 0.6%. So out of 5,400, 1,900 are affected by uh, acute kidney injury. When acute kidney inj injury occurs after hospitalization, it can be found upon admission or on day one, second day, third day. So it can occur uh, through the days of admissions. The presence of acute kidney injury is associated with poorer outcome. So the proportion of patients with acute kidney injury by requirement for non-invasive mechanical ventilation, those patients who uh, 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 states, uh, their states in a stated mechanical ventilation are associated with acute kidney injury and more uh, problems. So the, the presence of acute kidney injury uh, is associated with severe disease, and the higher the degree of acute kidney injury, the higher the, uh, the problem. So here, in a stage of acute kidney injury, uh, if there is, uh, it is 21% in, in patients who are not ventilated, but 89% any degree in those who require the invasive mechanical ventilation. A stage 1, 15% in non-ventilated, 24 in ventilated, 4.3, 22, stage 3, 20.4 percent in non-ventilated, 43 percent in ventilated patients require renal replacement therapy. About 2 percent of those who don't need mechanical ventilation, 23 percent of those patients who uh, uh, require the invasive mechanical ventilation. So, acute kidney injury is associated with severe diseases. What is the fate of acute kidney injury? Uh, this slide, uh, this figure shows clearly the outcome. Either the patient admitted, discharged, 
or died. If you look here, if there is no acute kidney injury, death is, uh, is significantly lower. But uh, in, if, if there is acute kidney injury, even in stage one increases mortality so much. And the higher the degree of acute kidney injury, the higher the degree of death. So acute kidney injury is bad uh, omen and associated with mortality. So this is a report from uh, different centers about dialysis. So I'm shifting from acute kidney injury to hemodialysis. As you see, this is the post patient admitted in different regions, both of our patients, both of overall and overall population. So the, here you can see in this uh, uh, region, it is 49 uh, out of 302, 16% post patients, 19, 12, 6, and 15%. So this is the percentage of dialysis of positive COVID, the hemodialysis patients. I think sex up to 16, 19%, it is quite high prevalence. So hemodialysis patients are more prone to COVID-19. And this is the 37 patients infected and managed as our patients. 57 SARS-CoV-2 infected patients uh, admitted to the hospital. Those who are treated as our patients, 51% uh, were 51% uh, symptomatic, 48% negative chest X-ray, 41% needs antiviral, 76% hydroxychloroquine, and this is the fate, 8% died. However, uh, in the four in patients, uh, seven to nine, so the treatment is intensified by these drugs, and then the outcome is poorer. So if the situation of the patient in states admission, we can expect poorer outcome. Uh, so the conclusion, variable disease severity in uh, hemodialysis patients, high risk of ARDS and death in subgroup required hospital admission. So admission of the patients uh, is a bad uh, situation. This is, this is the univariate analysis of the association between clinical characteristics and the risk of ARDS or death in hemodialysis patient to SARS-CoV-2. You can look at the odds ratio. For example, this is an odds ratio. It is, uh, if there is history of cardiac failure, the odds of ARDS increased by sixfold. So ARDS is linked, acute respiratory disease syndrome is linked to the states of the heart. Ischemic cardiac, 5.6, and the death, threefold. So again, this is, the, this is a nice data. Fever on admission, a disease diagnosis is associated with increased risk of development of acute respiratory distress, distress syndrome and mortality. This is why we should stress upon measuring the body temperature. Shorts of breeze is associated with, uh, uh, this is the uh, 18 like fever and here five for mortality. So we should look at the, this very simple clinical data. And the patients with high SCT, the increased risk of ARDS, and the CRB, arts and mortality. So the, any bold is associated with the outcome and we have two types of outcome, acute respiratory distress syndrome and death. What about multivariate analysis? So multivariate analysis of association between clinical characteristics and acute respiratory distress syndrome or death in hemodialysis, if we a look at acute respiratory distress, history of ischemic cardiac disease is still very significant in, is significant in the uh, multivariate analysis. Fever, 17-fold, the value is very highly significant. Age, older age is significant. Short surprise, very high significant. Myalgia, it lost its significance. So, we should stress upon ischemic cardiac disease, fever, and especially in all the patients and with the short surprise. All these are risk factors with acute respiratory disease syndrome. What about death? History of ischemic cardiac disease, it, the p-value is insignificant, but fever is associated with significant increased death. Uh, 
cough, it is not uh, statistical significant. CRB, or it is on the verge, CRB above 50 is associated in comparison to those who have lower than 50 as associated with significant increased uh, mortality. So I think these are very nice because they are very simple to be addressed. What about dialysis? We discussed the issue of dialysis in many Zoom meetings, but I like this slide because it gives a good idea about potential mechanisms of kidney damage and the treatment strategies in COVID-19 by extra corporeal therapy. So if we take them, so if we are focusing on cytokine damage, cytokine release syndrome, increased cytokine generation, hemophagocytic syndrome, so direct cytokine, uh, cytokine lesion, so cytokine removal using various approaches, direct hemoperfusion using a neutral uh, macroborous sorbent, plasma absorption resin after separation from whole blood, CRRT was hollow fi uh, fiber with absorbed properties, high dose, either uh, medium cutoff or high cutoff membrane, but to be careful because, because I don't like high cutoff membrane because of significant albumin loss. Uh, so at least we do uh, CRRT with high uh, flux hemodifiltration. Organ crosstalk, cardiomyopathy, we may need left ventricular assisted device or ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, alveolar damage, venovenous ECMO, high airway pressure, renal uh, compartment syndrome by using uh, venous, uh, venovenous ECMO, extracorporeal CO2 so removal, uh, rhabdomyolysis, uh, so you can look at the abbreviation under the table, rhabdomyolysis, tubular toxicity from myoglobin, uh, CRRT using high cutoff or medium cutoff, take care of high cutoff membrane because of protein leak, uh, systemic effect, post fluid balance, uh, continuous ultrafiltration diuretics, endothelial damage, third space fluid loss, hypotension, uh, vasopressor, rhabdomyolysis, CRRT, uh, endotoxin, endotoxin removal using uh, polystyrene fibers functionalized with polymyxin B. So this is not the regular dialysis. This is the extracorporeal therapy uh, according to the situation of the kidney and usually in acute kidney injury. But for regular, for patient who has COVID, but for regular dialysis patient, it is preferable to do high flux dialysis. And here in dialysis patients, in regular dialysis patients, this is a very risky group because they should come to the hospital. Even if we reduce the frequency, although not all of us agree about the reduction of frequency of dialysis because it can put the patient in danger of overload, but the, we should take care of all these patients and apply the, all the physiological barriers and the protective equipments. What about kidney transplantation? In kidney transplant, patients are more prone to infection in general. And in COVID-19, this is a, one of the cohorts, 36 patients. I like this table. Um, you can look the manifestation fever in 85%, 58%, cough 53%, dyspnea 44, myalgia 36, diarrhea 22, hospitalization, the majority of patients will be hospitalized. Radiological manifestation, 96%. Uh, treatment, usually we manipulate immune suppressive drug. <coughs> Sorry. Withdrawal of antimetabolites, this is the rule uh, in the majority of patients. Uh, withdrawal of tacrolimus in, sex, in severe disease. And there are some authors who prefer shifting from tacrolimus to cyclosporin on the hypothesis that cyclosporin has anti-coronavirus uh, effect. All this repurposes drug, hydroxychloroquine, uh, this is the, uh, in this cohort in 86%, uh, others, uh, azithromycin and uh, tocilizumab in two cases, high dose glucoid in two cases. So again, this is, this is a nice table, shows presentations, um, 
and the manipulations of treatment in a cohort of patients 36 affected by COVID. What is the fate, the outcome of those transplanted patients uh, with COVID-19 infected? So the outcome of median 21 day uh, follow up, death, 10 out of 36, so 28% death. Intubation, 39%. Death after intubation, 64. Renal replacement therapy, uh, 21. So the renal replacement therapy in transplant mean that means that graft is fail. Uh, remained hospitalized in uh, some of the patients and discharged from hospital. Those who are discharged, it's just 36% in this gloomy cohort of patients. Uh, we wrote this article. Uh, this is the group of Eurogen Nephrology Center. Uh, so this is from Eurogen and Nephrology Center. I am uh, honored to be among these authors in this uh, review that will appear in the October issue of the Journal of Physical Society of Nephrology. We discuss many sectors about COVID and the kidney transplantation, how to face the disaster. And we discuss the pathophysiology presentation and the transplant uh, program lockdown and then manipulation of immune suppression. This is one of the very interesting segment of the article is the, how to follow the immune suppression in our patients. So to, to start with, we should look at the patient and the lung affection. If there is a positive swab, swab is important, and then we should ask ourselves, if there is lung infiltrate, no lung infiltrate, so we continue the same regimen. We may have or stop antiproliferative doses and presence of comorbidities for those above 65 years, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, because we are expecting uh, bad disease. There is lung infiltrates. So uh, what is about the other manifestation? Lung infiltrates, no lung infiltrates or mild pyrexia, no hypoxemia. So this is the sector of the patient. Continuous steroid. 10 milligram per day, continue tacrolimus with this level. And I said, some uh, 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 suggest to shift to cyclosporin, but th this is what we follow to just to follow this level of tacrolimus, stop antiproliferative, and then evaluate the patient on the coming days. If there is no response within three days or deterioration of the state of the patients at any time, stop tacrolimus. So this is, I think it is rational. Lung infiltrates, presence of comorbidities. So this is lung infiltrate with no or mild uh, symptoms. Lung infiltrates with presence of comorbidities, uh, old age, diabetes, cardiovascular, high grade fever, hypoxemia, continue oral prednisolone, 10 milligram, continue tacrolimus with level 3.4, stop antiproliferative, no response within three days, or deterioration at any time, stop tacrolimus. So here we may even shorten the period uh, of follow-up and the, the, uh, to manipulate the drug. So here we can accept three, three to four nanogram per milliliter, sorry, this is three, uh, bond for nanogram per milliliter, and this is four uh, to six nanogram per milliliter. So, and this depends upon the associated manifestation. Lung infiltrate, no. Uh, or mild pyrexia, uh, the target tacrolimus is between four to six nanogram per ml, stop antiproliferation. Other comorbidities plus high grade fever, uh, accept lower target, more lower, three nanogram per ml, and the patient should be uh, thoroughly evaluated in, at any time we can stop all immune suppression and keep steroid only. Now, when we prescribe any reborbosis drug, we should take care of drug-drug interaction. And uh, I discussed the, the issue of drug interactions in one of a very important uh, uh, Zoom meetings about drug-drug interaction. For example, we don't like this drug, lobinavir etonavir, with tacrolimus or cyclosporin. If we start this combination, lobinavir etonavir, we should stop calcium inhibitor or to be used uh, by this dose uh, 0.5 to 1 once weekly. 
uh, fortunate enough today is we are not trusting this combination and it is not given for treating COVID patients. I'm honored to be a member of this unit, but the most important is uh, the effect of COVID in our program, transplantation program. From 1976 to 11th of March, we have uh, 3,128. But from 11th of March this year up to day, uh, August 13th, with, with the transplant program is logged down. I hope, as I discussed with Professor Amir Rafai, that uh, the um, transplantation will be resumed next week. We hope so. So what about the, if you, if you would like to read, uh, if, we, if you like to read in details, if you like to read in details and in abbreviated way, the kidney uh, in COVID patients, I recommend this review article because it discusses epidemiology to clinical practice of COVID and kidney. Then RAS blockade and COVID to continue or not. Uh, th this was discussed in this interesting hot issue in nephrology. And uh, this is one of the articles. Why, why are RAS inhibitors, there is fear of RAS inhibitors because uh, we are afraid if we use S inhibitor or uh, ARPS, AC2 is increased as compensatory. If AC2 is increased, and we know that the virus finds its way to cells through binding AC2, this may increase the virus, increase the virus entry and increase the disease. But, le look us, uh, 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 but let us to look at the data. This is a very nice cohort uh, assessing the relationship of the use of antihypertensives, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, ACE and, or ARBs, beta blocker, calcium uh, channel blocker and thiazide. And here, this is the groups of patients uh, severe COVID patients treated, severe COVID patient, patient not treated. So here, this is ACE inhibitors. For those who are treated, 23% severe disease, who are not treated, 27%. So ACE inhibitor doesn't increase the risk. The same for ARBs, no increase in real risk of severe disease and other uh, uh, antihypertensive drugs. And this is for all matched patients, severe disease uh, treated with medications, severe COVID not treated, again, no significant difference. So here, S inhibitor is 23% and no S inhibitor 25% severe disease. This means that this cohort of patients is assuring towards safety. More recent study, this is use of renin and rutensin aldosterone system inhibitors and the risk of COVID-19 requiring the admission to the hospital, a case population study. Uh, this is very assuring uh, to the extent, as you see here, the available evidence supports that RAS inhibitors are safe and they shouldn't be discontinued for fear of an increased risk of COVID-19. Because those patients are associated with many cardiovascular problems and we know that RAS blockades are essential cardiovascular treatment. The question, should we shift between RAS blockade, this is from Mayo Clinic, ARBs could potentially be a more favorable treatment option in patients with COVID-19 at higher risk for severe forms of disease. When we discuss this issue with Professor Halawa uh, with uh, Liverpool uh, Zoom and webinar, I was asked by one of the audience, is it rational to shift from is inhibitors to angiotensin receptor blockers in patients who have COVID. And my answer was, if you are con concerned by dry cough because COVID patient may present with cough and is inhibitor may be associated with cough, it's okay. Use RAS uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. And this data of Mayo Clinic confirm the rationale. Uh, which is very recent, August, COVID-19 and the angiotensin converted enzyme inhibitor angiotensin receptor blocker theory. This is an editorial comments reviewing all what is published. And this is the, uh, uh, the comments. They 
are the authors are uh, now having a reasonable reassurance that drugs that alter the renin angiotensin system don't pose substantial threats as either COVID-19 risk factors or severity multiplier. But to be honest, they also added a statement. They also don't add benefit uh, for COVID-19. But we use them not for COVID-19. We use them for the sake of cardiovascular and other risk factors. Uh, this is a very important and very essential review about cardiovascular diseases in COVID patients. And this is a very clear statement written within the review. No benefit of withdrawal of ACE inhibitors or ARPs in protecting against COVID-19. So we should continue using them until we have other evidence against this. Anemia. We are afraid of using ESA therapy because they may increase erythropoiesis and increase coagulation. So we should be careful if the patient on dialysis and he's already uh, treated by ESA therapy, we should monitor hypercoagulability state. And we can expect the, some resistance because of inflammation. But if the patient is admitted and who was or she was not treated with ESA therapy, and then the state co is complicated by anemia and acute kidney injury, no rationale for using ESA therapy because this may increase hypercoagulability and increase risk. Although there is some uh, letter to the editor showing that ESA therapy may ameliorate the disease. So patients with uh, or without AKI and anemia uh, don't give ESA therapy. But patients on dialysis, it is blue line means it is not uh, without risk. So continue is a therapy, but ex don't increase the dose and monitor the patient well for hypercoagulability state. What about vitamin D? I like it very much. Although the evidence is lacking because we are waiting the results of randomized control study. But if you look here, this is one of the figures showing that vitamin D has biotropic effect inhibiting adjutin 2 pathway, which is bad, and even potentiate AC2, which is beneficial, protective, that is uh, disrupted by the virus. So by this way, uh, the vitamin D reduces this bad uh, angiotensin sin 2 inflammation vasoconstriction and restore AC2 enzyme, isoenzyme, which is beneficial for even for the lung. So the, uh, the NICE show no evidence to support vitamin D. However, the patient is isolated with social distancing and vitamin D deficiency is very common. So it seems that it is rational to use between 1,000 to 5,000 uh, units is needed to maintain optimal blood level. I myself, uh, uh, I am convinced with vitamin D. And uh, this is very nice. Meta-analysis uh, addressed all studies uh, for uh, vitamin D and the prevention of diabetes. In patients with prediabetes, this is the conclusion. Vitamin D supplementation at moderate to high dose, above 1,000 units per day, but not at lower doses, significantly reduced the incidence of type 2 diabetes compared with placebo uh, for those who have prediabetes. So again, vitamin D is effective. And in COVID patients, we can expect the many problems, vitamin D deficiency, inflammation, risk of diabetes. So it is, it is wise to use vitamin D. Uh, and this is my opinion until we have a clear opinion from randomized controlled study. What about the other dr the drugs used for treating uh, COVID, uh, co uh, coronavirus? So this is a statement uh, clinical management interim guidance in 18 of May this year, antiviral immune modulator and other adjunctive therapies for COVID-19. This is the recommendations, clinical management guidelines. They recommend that following drugs not be administered as treatment or prophylaxis outside the context of clinical trials. And these drugs include chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, plus or minus adistromycin, antiviral lubinavir, ritonavir, remidesivir, and uh, amifinovir, flavibravir, immune modulator 
Tocilizumab, interferon beta 1A, plasma therapy. So all these uh, are to be within the uh, trial or status. What is the state now? This is a hydroxychloroquine status. This is a very nice study, including here. This is the uh, open label randomized controlled study. Hydroxychloroquine plus adistromycin, hydroxychloroquine, and the control without them. What are the, uh, the results? Hydroxychloroquine is given at a dose of 400 milligram twice daily, plus azithromycin at a dose of 500 milligram once daily for seven days in the arm of combination. And hydroxychloroquine for the same dose in the arm of hydroxychloroquine and the standard arm, no hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin. And this is the scoring system, how they evaluate the patient. This is a very nice score. You can read the score here. One indicate not hospitalized, all this, uh, the, this um, lighter color indicate not hospitalized with no limitation of activities. It, two, not hospitalized but with limitation of activities. Three, hospitalized and not receiving supplemental oxygen. Four, hospitalized receiving oxygen. Five, hospitalized and received the oxygen supplementation administered by high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation. Hospitalized sex receiving mechanical ventilation. So this sex means mechanical ventilation. Seven, the patient died. If you look at the three arms, hydroxychloroquine, blood adistromycin, hydroxy and control, you can see no difference. The use of hydroxychloroquine either alone or with adistromycin doesn't add anything for treating COVID-19 patients. What about prophylaxis, post exposure prophylaxis? This is 821 asymptomatic participants who are exposed to the risk. And this is the uh, results. In comparison to placebo, so this randomized controlled trial, confirmed or probable COVID-19, it is 11% in hydroxychloroquine, 14% in placebo, B value is 0.3, no significant difference. Symptoms, 11.6, uh, here the lab, 20.7, 20.2, symptoms 11.6, 13.5, uh, again, B value insignificant. All new symptoms insignificant, hospitalization the same, death no in the both arms. So the, this study uh, gives no evidence, no evidence of any benefit of hydroxychloroquine. So regarding the efficacy, either for treating COVID or to protect and prevent COVID by using hydroxychloroquine is very deficient. So what about safety? There is a problem in safety. Although we, we use this drug for many years now in treating lupus nephritis, but uh, take care in, in era of COVID, there, there is a risk of cardiac diseases. That's why we should monitor ECG if we decide to give the patient hydroxychloroquine or a combination with azithromycin. This is a systematic review showed that the percentage of QT, QT prolongation torsade de bois, which is fatal arrhythmia and sudden death uh, with a short course of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, uh, this cocktail may occur in 10% of uh, cases. And these are the risk factors, electrolyte disturbance, sepsis, and the cardiac disease. So we should monitor the patient state and the ECG is mandatory. What about Remedisivir? This is one of the strongest uh, trial done up to date. This is double-blinded randomized controlled study, including a large number of patients. So adult hospitalized with COVID-19 with evidence of lower respiratory involvement. So the patient should have pneumonia. Patient were randomly assigned to receive either Remedisivir, 200 milligram loading dose intravenous infusion, followed by 100 milligram daily for up to nine days. So 10 day treatment, one day 200 milligram and nine days each day, every day one, 100 only, or placebo. So we have two arm double blind placebo randomized control study. As I mentioned, 500 patients, uh, more than 500 patients in each arm. What are the main results? If you look at the here, the remedy is very placebo, uh, number of recoveries here, number of recoveries are higher in remedisivir in comparison to placebo. Occurrence of uh, severe scores that I'm 
explain, I explained in the previous slide, here this and severe disease ventilation, you find uh, the, uh, this outcome is uh, uh, reduced, the borer outcome is reduced by uh, remdesivir. So uh, hazard ratio here is 0.7, to so put in mind 0.4, 0.4, uh, but the ventilation this here it is so it, still there is increase increased mortality it is reduced by a not um, fantastic reduction but it is a nice reduction of mortality so this trial is positive toward the beneficial effect of remedy in treating the patient this is different scores uh, and i explained them before this is a very interesting study because remediator may be not available. So uh, comparing five days to 10 days, just giving the remediator for five days or 10 days, this is the five days, 10 days, arms, 200 in each arm. There is no real difference. So it is a randomized open label phase three trial involving hospitalized patients with confirmed, confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection oxygen saturation for 94% or less while they were breathing ambient air and the radi radiological evidence of pneumonia should be there. Patients were randomly assigned one-to-one -to, -one to receive intravenous remedesivir for five or 10 days. All patients received 200 milligram of remedesivir on day one and 100 milligram once a daily on subsequent days. These are four days uh, for five days treatment and nine days for 10 days treatment. Primary endpoint was clinical status on day 14, as is on seven point ordinal scale as I demonstrated. I was asked by Professor uh, Basim, the director of the uh, Eurogen Nephrology Center during the presentation, uh, should we uh, can we give remedesivir for those patients who are treated um, on the outpatient basis? The answer is not based upon the patient should have pneumonia, the, and the drug is giving in parenteral. So no way to give it to mid, low uh, grade manifestations. Patient who progress to mechanical ventilation may benefit from 10 days of remedesivir. So if we say the result at large, no difference, but for those patients with severe disease to continue for 10 days, liver function test must be monitored daily and the remedesivir is discontinued in patient with ALT five times over the normal. What is the state in the use? Can we use remedesivir in patients with acute or chronic kidney disease? Uh, the problem is up to this moment, this drug is tested in GFR about 30 milliliter per minute. So uh, we are waiting. Uh, so the uh, GFR is limitation and to follow liver function test. So remedesivir may be beneficial and uh, has additional point to save life and to uh, ameliorate the disease. Tocilizumab, which is interleukin-6 receptor antagonist. This is a retrospective cohort study, including a relatively large number of patients, 179 treated with either sub-Q or intravenous tocilizumab uh, versus standard 365 cases. This is a dose. Tocilizumab is given in a dose of 8 milligram per kg up to 800 in two infusions, 12 hour apart, or sub-Q at 162 milligram administered in two simultaneous doses. So the total dose is 324 milligram in total. Uh, uh, this is, again, this retrospective cohort shows that the use of uh, tocilizumab is beneficial regarding, if you look here, death, this is the 8%, 7% in tocilizumab, either sub-Q or intravenous. In comparison, and overall tocilizumab is 7%, uh, in comparison to 20% in placebo. So the use of tocilizumab reduces mortality. So this is the advantage of using uh, this drug. So the outcome is, composite outcome is uh, uh, reduced by using tocilizumab. So tocilizumab administered intravenous or sub-Q may be capable of reducing the risk of invasive mechanical ventilation or death in patients with severe uh, COVID pneumonia. 
Again, vitamin B. I like it because vitamin B may be cheaper uh, interleukin-6 receptor uh, targeting or interleukin-6 targeting drug. So it, it's better to uh, avoid vitamin D deficiency and to replace vitamin D uh, by supplementation. Um, dexamethasone therapy, another very interesting open label randomized controlled trial. It is uh, beneficial using oral or intravenous dexamethasone in a dose of 60 milligrams once daily for up to 10 days or to receive usual care alone, uh, proven beneficial effect as you see here, respiratory support. Um, uh, so invasive mechanical ventilation is lower uh, in dexamethasone, oxygen only. Uh, the um, old patient, as you see here, this is the diamond, is showing the safety. So effect of dexamethasone on 28 day mortality in different characteristics dexamethasone was efficient to reduce mortality in COVID patients. So uh, this is the mortality at 28 days, 20.9, 25% in usual care. So this is uh, 3% saving uh, uh, mortality, saving life. It's fantastic. Rate of all the uh, risk is less than one significantly. Uh, so this is again positive study. Uh, some authors is, uh, uh, are convinced by that it is low dose. It's not low dose, 6 milligram, because the, the unit in dexamethasone is 0.75 milligram. So uh, when we give dexamethasone for 10 days, we should look at plasma glucose because patients with COVID may be associated with diabetes by three mechanisms. New also diabetes because of COVID, because a virus may affect islets of the pancreas, so uh, there is new onset diabetes after uh, COVID. Number two, the state of inflammation may lead to insulin resistance. Using dexamethasone may uh, lead to this, so we should be careful about hyperglycemia and that may be complicated by ketosis. What about convalescent plasma? It is we, the, this is it, this is a very exciting, and we. And the, uh, the dogma was convalescent plasma will be fantastic, clearing the virus. This is the randomized study, randomized clinical trial, 52 in each arm. Uh, this, this the question was, what is the effect of convalescent plasma therapy added to standard care compared to standard treatment uh, on clinical outcome in patients with severe or life-threatening coronavirus disease? And based on some cases, some case reports or case series, we were expecting a marvelous response, but the, uh, the study was negative. Among patients with severe or life-threatening COVID, convalescent plasma therapy added to standard treatment didn't significantly improve the time to clinical improvement within 28 days. Although the trial was terminated early, and it may have been underpowered, to detect the clinical important difference. But regarding the antibodies, because uh, uh, we may expect that if the person has IgG antibody against coronavirus, uh, by default, it is uh, neutralizing. The answer is not. Usually, there is a test for IgG, and there is a test for the titer, so we can know the titer. If the titer of the antibody is very high, 500 or more, we can expect neutralizing capacity of this level of IgG. And there is in vitro testing to assess neutralizing capacity. So not any IgG antibody is neutralizing. And there are many prerequisites to allow for convalescent plasma therapy. And I think we are waiting further studies. So as you see, the evidence for treatment is uh, uh, somehow little. There is some potential of remedesivir and dexamethasone, but not fantastic, as I mentioned. Uh, this is, uh, this uh, urge some uh, scientists to put hypothesis, like this study, li like this uh, hypothesis, famotidine, which is H2 receptor blocker. It is a hope or hype. Hype means noise. It is hope or noise or headache. 
So what is the rationale of famotidine? Famotidine may be immune modulator. The same for proton pump inhibitor because uh, there is assumption that this is uh, immune. By the way, the famotidine is now an assessment in a trial. Um, so uh, BBI, proton pump inhibitor, uh, if this hypothesis is valid, this means that use of BPI will ameliorate the disease. But as I mentioned in the Zoom meeting of BPI and COVID, no, in clinical cohort, the uh, results were, uh, current BPI usage was associated with worse outcome of COVID, so it is, it is nonsense. Uh, the short-term current use of BPI for less than a month conferred a significant increased risk. So all these are hype and headache. What about diabetes? If the patient has mild diabetes, we can treat with metformin, but to take care of gastroside effects and the risk of lactic acidosis, stop if there is a severe illness. Uh, uh, in diabetes uh, with COVID, both SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, which, uh, who, which are magic drugs in general, are not uh, recommended in diabetes because the use of SGL2 inhibitors increase the risk of dehydration and euglycemic ketoacidosis. Stop SGL2 inhibitors if oral intake is not tolerated or the patient has severe illness. Stop in severe ill uh, the uh, GLAB1 receptor agonist. DB4 is exciting and may be continued in non critical ill patients. Why? Because the virus can find its way to the, the cell through DBB4. So if we block DBB4 by DBB4 inhibitors, this may be a fantastic mechanism of action. Sulfonylurea stop uh, because of the risk of hypoglycemia and the kidney problem. Bioglitazone stop because of hemodynamic instability and overload. Insulin, the best drug if there is moderate to severe disease. No way. Insulin and regular monitoring of glycemia state. Continue ACE or ARB, as I mentioned. Aspirin, continue uh, if the patient is on aspirin, and then statin to be individualized the decision in diabetic patients. Another interesting point is if we used any repurposed drugs to be careful about drug-drug interaction. So chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine uh, may lead to hypoglycemia and other side effects. To be careful, because in India, for example, uh, uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are approved as hypoglycemic agents. Uh, Lubinavir, tunavir, hyperglycemia, glucocorticoid hyperuricemia, uh, hyperglycemia, remedesivir, hepatotoxicity. This is why we should monitor uh, ALTST in these patients and then a caution with a statin because both of them may be associated with problems. What about urology? This is the last sector of the presentation regarding the endurological storm management in the era of COVID 19. Is there any algorithm? I like this article because it is published in the European Association of Urology and considered as platinum opinion. Uh, we will take this algorithm uh, by step by step. So patient uh, is scheduled for surgery. What then we should assess surgical prior assessment. Uh, uh, surgery is uh, surg surgical priority are there because if it is not priority, it's not in mandatory surgery, it is better to be postponed to avoid hospitalization and exposure and to save uh, the, uh, the issue, the doctors and the care for the patients, other patients, COVID patients, and to avoid exposure to the environment of the hospital. So, uh, so this is why we encourage here telemedicine and then evaluate the case. Then by telephone, if there is fever or not. If the patient is febrile, then what about the surgical emergency? It is, uh, is, it, is it emergency or not? If the surgery is not emergency, medical consultation or ER visit or stay at home. But if it is a surgical emergency, and suspected COVID-19 because the patient has fever. Yes, dedicated COVID-19 or ward facilities. No ward admission. So this is the way. No fever, no risk of uh, the disease. Go ahead, especially 
if the, the patient is in surgical emergency. But in, in case of fever, if there is fever and surgical emergency, go ahead uh, to the regular ward if you uh, have uh, confidence of no COVID. But if there is COVID, do take care of COVID uh, management uh, or treating the patient in a special area. Uh, no emergency postpone the uh, procedures because of uh, the problems that you may encounter. If there is no fever and there is no onset of respiratory tract symptoms or within 14 days, close contact with a confirmed or suspected case. So if you have either new onset respiratory symptom or exposure within two, uh, two weeks, uh, COVID-19 patient without wearing uh, personal protective equipment, returned from a high-risk country. I think it's now universal. So if the patient is traveling, so we should check. Yes, again, assess surgical emergency. If no, ward admission. So if the patient, no fever, no risk, no symptoms, no exposure, so the patient is admitted. But if there is problem here and this, the uh, surgical emergency is yes or no. If there is problem and it is no medical consultation and they stay at home. If surgical emergency is mandatory, is yes, dedicated COVID area. If no, ward admission. So again, endurological management of a stone depends upon uh, the manifestations, laboratory tests, chest X-ray, and the good history is, is mandatory. And we should prioritize the management according to the necessity of uh, uh, intervention and the safety for both uh, doctors or healthy care providers and patients. Uh, I like this line. If we are here, we can delay the intervention in intervention. If the kidney is not obstructed, so there is renal stone, but non obstructing normal kidney function, and you are not speaking about solitary kidney. So in this way, and there are no symptoms, uh, to, to mild symptoms, a delay here. Either no symptom or some symptom, you can delay here. Non-obstructive stone, uh, chronic impaired kidney function, solitary kidney, ureteral renal stone, and dwelling stent in a frostomy, no symptoms or symptom, this is midway. If the kidney is obstructed, uh, stone obstructed, normal kidney function, solitary, so assess, but the urgent interference is obstructed, obstructing ureteral or renal stone in solitary kidney, acute impaired kidney function, bilateral obstruction, unmanageable symptoms, infected ureteral or renal stones, other stone related urgent situation, uh, don't delay and you can deal with the patient even if, if the patient is COVID, confirm it, in a COVID world, taking all the uh, protective equipment. I recommend all uh, those who are interested in the urology aspects and standard of care to review this systemic review. And then what about renal cancer in COVID uh, era? Uh, I like this table. This is uh, triaging the patients according to the rate of progression of cancer and the situation of the patient. So surgical patient triage depends upon local transmission pattern and hospital needs, lower risk of kidney tumor should be postponed, while larger and aggressive tumor should be treated at the risk of progression, must be weighed against the risk of COVID-19. COVID testing, all patients planned to undergo surgery for kidney cancer should be tested prior to surgery, depending on local community access to testing. COVID-19 positive patient, if the patient is COVID-19 positive, every effort should be made to delay surgery until full recovery of patient and uh, viral shedding. Uh, operating room personnel, limit personnel in the operating room during surgery, allowing only essential personnel and limit traffic in and out of room. Uh, protective equipment is mandatory, should include in 95 masks to mitigate transmission risk. Operating room risk reduction effort should be made to reduce transmission during intubation and extubation with only essential personnel present during the time. In addition, surgical transmission via surgical uh, plum should be reduced by lowering uh, cautery, application time, and the total duration of tissue desiccation. 
a special consideration for minimally invasive surgery. During minimal invasive surgery, CO2 pressure should be maintained as low as safely possible. And the gas leak or release from pores during surgery should be minimized. Every effort should be made uh, to suction uh, any residual CO2 at the end of procedure prior to tumor extraction. The lastly, uh, uh, closed insufflation system should be used to reduce escape of CO2 into OR filters. Very inside the smallest filter available should be implemented to the suction system. So this all. These are technical aspects, but for my mind, the presence of a skillful operator uh, to avoid the uh, longer time, uh, I think it is, is important, and to reduce the issue of training in this uh, period of time. Regarding the, uh, so this is the, uh, the ugly face of COVID, but the good face of, and the beautiful face of COVID, it is not beautiful but uh, it stimulates us to have uh, non-traditional ways of thinking, collaboration, uh, using tele-education, telemedicine, all these facilities. And I would like to, congrat to, to congratulate Professor Amir Fai for establishing a system we have, uh, before COVID, we have regular meeting in the morning for 30 minutes or one hour to discuss uh, the cases and with special uh, long meeting on Monday to discuss uh, the prepared case for transplantation. But in the era of COVID, we replaced the uh, close contact in the, in the early morning by uh, having a special Watts group uh, to uh, have the meeting all through 24 hours. And I like this uh, slide because this is what we did uh, is to have uh, this ACNT Virtual Academy in uh, reality. So this is the harvest of uh, the uh, lectures and the, and the videos, 4,627 lectures, 1,000 video, 871, uh, so approximately 2,000, we are near 2,000, uh, 28,000 views are all over the world. So this is a very, important to the extent it stimulated us to write a review article about evolution of telemedicine and nephrology in Egypt before and during COVID-19, a journey of 15 years of experience because we started by humble Mansour and Nephrology Club uh, 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 electronic data resource, including Ask the Expert in 2005. And from 2000, from, uh, and the 12, so eight years now, we have this system that evolved with time. And currently, we have frequent Zooms with international speakers and attended by uh, ligands and colleagues from uh, Arab world, from Egypt and Arab world and, the, and the Africa. I would like to stop here and hoping uh, you all the best. This is the, I think this is the best place, the Garden of the Orange and the First Center. Uh, I'm happy today to, uh, to have uh, this uh, real lecture in the morning today at the, in the big auditorium of the Royal Jennifer Center attended by uh, the, my colleagues and Professor Bassem, the director of the center, and Professor Amir Fai. Uh, it is, um, I hope, safety for all, hoping that I added some update. Although the clinical trials are depressive, frustrating, but there is some hope of remedies there dexamethasone, and I added for my mind vitamin D. I, I'm interested in vitamin D because I'm expecting vitamin D deficiency. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any points, uh, any question, please write your comment on the video because I'm going to upload uh, this, this video uh, today. Thank you and goodbye.